Okay, let's talk about continuity and limits for piecewise functions. I want to just do some examples here because the book doesn't go into a lot of detail and they don't have a really ex explicit example. And um, it's really piecewise functions where continuity is usually difficult to figure out. Um, one of the things in the book, one of the most important theorems, and you need to be following along in your book with this uh, video or else you're not going to be able to figure out what I'm talking about. On page 129, there's a nice theorem. Let's see if it shows up on the video here. Yeah, somewhat. The following types of functions are continuous to every number in the, their domains. Basically, every kind of function we're, we're familiar with except piecewise defined functions. Uh, so this means that the only place most functions are discontinuous are where it's sort of obvious, um, like the tangent function they plot above here. The tangent isn't even defined and it has these big old asymptotes at pi over 2, minus pi over 2. There's something really bad going on there and we kind of have focused on that as soon as you learn about the tangent function. We, we focus on the fact that it's kind of a weird function. So that's definitely something to pay attention to, but it's something we're more familiar with um, in terms of a bad point of a function. Uh, besides those guys, besides those kinds of, of properties, which are still important, um, it's actually really rare for a function to be discontinuous, and the best way to create a discontinuous function, if you want to, is with a piecewise definition. Okay, so let's do uh, an example. First of all, let's say example one will be f of x is defined to be cosine x if x is less than or equal to zero and x if x is greater than zero. Classic kind of piecewise function where I put two unrelated functions together and we'll talk about other functions, other piecewise functions where it's not so random and the pieces relate to each other better, but let's look at this. So first of all, let's uh, let's sketch it. They often, when they pose these problems in the book, they often say, calculate this limit, blah, 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 and then at the end they say, sketch the function. Well, you should do the sketch first, if possible, uh, because that's where you get some intuition as to what's going on. So here's cosine, and here's x. And you notice that I've drawn an open circle here. And when you first learn about piecewise functions, that's just a rule. You say when there's, it's a greater than and not a greater than or equal to, you put an open circle. And that's really kind of w where we leave it, just like that's a rule to remind us what's going on. Well, let's think about this. Certainly the closed circle, that has a meaning that we already know from pre-calc. That's the actual value of the function. f of 0, that's 1 there, f of 0 is equal to 1. Because when you look at this piecewise function, let's remember how piecewise functions work. When you plug an x into it, you look at this big complicated thing. You do not start reading on the left. You start reading over here. It's a little bit weird. It's you, contrary to our usual convention, you read from the right to left here. You look for which which of these cases is active. Okay, zero. X is zero. That satisfies this condition, and that tells you that this is the operable function. Cosine of zero is one. Okay, so that means that th that's where the closed dot should be, because it's the actual honest to God function value. But it still begs the question, why do we even put an open circle here at all? Why not just have a line that kind of tapers off and not worry about a circle? It's because this circle is a limit value. It has a very precise meaning, but a meaning that we could not have told you in pre-calculus, because we don't talk about limits yet. What that says is, that if this trend of values were to continue, then that would produce a, a f of 0 equals 0. Now, that's not the actual value, and that's going to be very important. It's going to show that it's discontinuous, and I'm going to ignore my phone, uh, but we can definitely write it down. The x goes to 0 from above, or sorry, from the right is a better way to say that, from positive values, is equal to 0. Okay, and right off the bat, from just thinking hard about what the open circle means, I've, I can see that this function is discontinuous. Because here's the function value, it's equal to 1. Here's the limit value from one side, it's equal to 0. Now, let's see if I can squeeze this in, I think I can. The limit value from the other side, 
I'm doing this graphically. I want to. I'll kind of come back in a second and do it just out of the algebra without looking at the graph. Think about for a minute what the limit value from the other side is. From the left, the trend of these guys, it looks like it's going towards that closed circle. And indeed, that's going to be correct. That's equal to 1. Let me show you how we could do that with algebra. And because that, that could be very important if we don't want to have to graph or if the graph is hard to do, especially if we don't have our calculator. So I'm going to rewrite this up here f of x equals cos x if x is less than or equal to 0, x if x is greater than 0. And now I want to just calculate those limit values. And that's the crucial thing, to be really precise about a continuity test. And especially if you can only get it from algebra and not a picture, is to look at limits. What is the limit as x goes to 0 from below of f of x? Because what we observed from the picture was that probably the most important thing was the fact that these two limit values weren't equal. Even disregarding where, what the value of the function is at that point, what's more important is that there's this jump happening. What the value of the function is isn't super important. This could have been the closed circle, this could have been the open circle. Or they might have been both been open and there might not, not have been a function value. That's just changing one measly little point and it doesn't change the overall shape and the fact that there's a, a, an, infinite, an infinitely fast jump in the function. That's what's recorded by the fact that these two limits are different. So, how do we take limits when you're looking at the breakpoint of a, of a piecewise function? If I were taking the limit as x goes to 5, say, then I'm plugging in numbers near 5 and only this line is ever going to matter. It's as if it isn't piecewise at all. That's like taking this picture and just taking some limit over here. Who cares that the weir weird stuff is going on at the breakpoint or to the left of it? It doesn't matter. But it's all, always more interesting to take it at the breakpoint. When you do it at the breakpoint, even if you're interested, even if you think you want to do just the limit as x goes to 0 without plus or minus, you're going to have to split it up into two pieces. That's not an option. You have to split it up into two pieces if you're taking a limit at the breakpoint of a piecewise function. The good thing is, once you split it up into two pieces, this says put in numbers that are just less than 0. As long as the numbers are less than 0, this is the only function that's active. And so the first thing you can do is, as is very common in mathematics, you just do one little step at a time. I don't change this. I don't even try to evaluate it yet. I just realize that because that's telling me I'm only interested in values that are a little less than 0, it's as if this is the, the only operable function. And now you ignore where it came from. You just say, suppose somebody gave me that problem. Is this one of our nice functions? This is one of the nice functions that has the direct substitution property. You plug in z 0, it's the same thing as doing the limit. And that's, so that's cosine of 0 equals 1. Similarly, if I do the limit on the other side, if x is greater than 0, notice I haven't changed this, I'm not really trying to do the limit yet, I'm just r utilizing the fact that this f of x is only mentioned inside the limit. Since I'm only going to be plugging in numbers x that are a little bit bigger than 0, I can just replace that with a much simpler function. And that definitely has the direct substitution property. The limit of that guy is 0. Then and only then, at the very end, do you compare these guys. And you note that they're not equal. And so certainly, the limit doesn't exist, the full two-sided limit. does not exist because we've got a jump discontinuity. Not only have we figured out that this is DNE, because of the way we calculated it, we can explain exactly what's going on here. From the left, it's approaching 1. From the right, it's approaching 0. And that's not a good situation. So I'm going to stop in just a second. But let me point out one other way to, to visualize what we just did here. This first line, the limit becoming the limit of cosine, what we're basically doing is we're saying, suppose this trend of cosine actually did continue. Now, it doesn't, because as soon as I get past 0, this is not the definition of the function anymore. But that's kind of what I'm allowed to do. If I say, well, what were, if the trend were to continue, what would it be at 0? And that's what this calculation says. The other way is you approach from the right, and you just say, well, what if that function sailed on through? And you were just, you were just looking at that function. That's what this does. And this says, OK, well, what is that? Oh, that's just y equals x at x equals 0, so you get 0. OK, that's a good place to stop.